and embodied from Hill Country, Austin, and we've got a message here from Jim Botts this morning. So to the title of today's is The Rested Body, and I don't know if y'all are like me, but I could use a little rested body. So uh, just enjoy the message today. Hello, hello. Great to be with you guys today. I want to give a warm welcome, especially those of you who are joining us. Maybe you're online or at one of our locations. We're glad you're with us today because we're continuing a series called Embodied, the theology of the whole self. We've been learning that God's eternal plan for every person involves your body. And so we've been learning how to follow Jesus' body and soul. And so today I want to talk with you about the rested body. We're going to go on a little tour through the scriptures. So if you would, turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, where we're going to begin our tour together. So you turn to Genesis 2, and I'll catch you in just a moment where we'll start our time together. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you would agree with this statement? Life feels like it's speeding up. Anyone does it feel that way to you? I mean, I feel it. You feel it. All of us feel it in one way, shape, or form. Truth is, though, some feel it more than others. A Tacoma, Washington newspaper ran the story of Tattoo the Basset Hound. Now, Tattoo didn't intend to go for an evening run off Tattoo the Basset Hound had no choice but to go for an evening run. Motorcycle officer Terry Filbert told reporters that he noticed a vehicle pass by dragging something behind it. So he pulled out behind, chased down the car, and he eventually unleashed the dog. But not before Tattoo the Basset Hound reached the top speed of 25 miles an hour. Poor dog, just tripping over his own feet, being dragged down the road. Well, the policeman went on to tell reporters, quote, that poor dog was just picking him up and just putting him down as fast as he could. By show of hands, how many of you have ever felt like that dog? Anybody? You ever felt like that? Like you're just being dragged through life, just tripping over your own feet, tethered to something you just can't get away from? Well, the truth is, our world is a fast Paced world, and this fast paced world is turning us into busybodies. Busybodies being dragged through life by relentless busyness. And the result is we don't know how. We just live tethered lives, and we don't know how to unleash ourselves from this relentless busyness in the world around us. Let me give you a couple examples of how we don't know how to untether. Exhibit A. There's a, a group called Sorbet. They consult um, organizations on their pay time off. They just released their study at the end of 2022. Sorbet reported that 55% of the pay time off for American workers went unused in 2022, which means most of us just, we don't know how to untether ourselves, to unleash from the productivity cycle. Here's another one, exhibit B. Forbes magazine reported a study that found that between 50 and 70 million Americans suffer from sleep disorders that are having a profound impact both mentally and physically. In fact, this explains why the sleep aid market, the sleep aid market is all about like creating specialty beds to improve sleep or specialty devices to improve sleep or specialty pillows or medications. The sleep aid market in 2022, reported the annual revenue of $65 billion, with a B, $65 billion. Friends, our culture has a plan. Our culture has a plan for your body, and that's to make you a busybody, to drag you through life, tethered to relentless busyness, unable to unleash yourself from some unachievable need to achieve. But here's the good news today. God has a better plan. God has a plan. He has given us a gift that enables us to care for our souls and our bodies, to restore, to renew us. What is that gift? Well, simply put, in a word, it's the word Sabbath. You know, for many of us, we hear the word Sabbath, we're like, whoa, Sabbath? Like, really? That's what we're doing? Sabbath? Like, isn't that an old, like, 1950s blue laws kind of thing? Listen, the concept of Sabbath is a whole lot older than that. So here's what I want to say to you today. Take a moment 
and suspend your preconceived concept of what Sabbath is and hear anew and afresh, maybe for the first time, what the scriptures say about God's good gift to us called the Sabbath, a gift designed to restore us body and soul. What's the Sabbath? Well, I put together this definition. Here's the definition of Sabbath. Sabbath is the once a week rhythm of spending a whole day abandoning busyness to rest in God's goodness. Sabbath. I want you to write that definition down and take that with you because that's a good definition to use as we think about what do we do with this concept of Sabbath. Now, historically, there has been a lot of confusion, even conflict over the concept of Sabbath. So I just wanna put a few basic facts on the table before we get too far. Here's the first one. Sabbath technically is the seventh day of the week, which would be Friday sundown to Saturday at sundown. That's a day of weekly rest from work. That's the basic biblical description. But the second fact I wanna, fact I wanna put before you today is that there are many people who say Sabbath, isn't that for Jewish people because it's in the Old Testament law? And here's what I would say to that, it is not. Sabbath in the scriptures is not anchored to the law. It's anchored to creation. It's not for Jewish people. It shows up in the law. It's for all people. It takes me to fact number three. It was the early Christians in the first century who traded the practice of a Saturday Sabbath over for the practice of a Sunday Lord's Day to honor and remember and celebrate the day that Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus rose on the first day of the week. That's a Sunday. In fact, in John chapter 20 on Easter, that afternoon in verse 19, the first day of the week, Jesus appeared to his disciples on a Sunday. His next appearance to his disciples was one week later on a Sunday, John 20, verse 26. And so much so is the habit of Jesus and the Lord's Day being a Sunday, that by the end of the first century, in, in Revelation chapter one, verse 10, the apostle John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So it had become the new practice. So when it comes to scripture, friends, we have to understand Sabbath is God's good gift given to you and to me for all to renew, to restore, to recharge us, body and soul. So here's the big idea today. We're gonna notice this as we work through the scriptures today. I want you to write this down. Our big idea is if you would keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath would keep you. If you would keep, this could become a practice in your life. This practice would keep you from so many things that God never intended. Now, scientists have found that human beings, we are hardwired for rhythmic activity. In other words, our bodies were designed for rhythmic activity, for routines. That's how our bodies are designed. By show of hands, how many of you, when you take a shower, you follow a similar routine every time? Come on, show of hands, right? It's like, I usually do. I start right here and I go over there and other things, right? By show of hands, how many of you, when you shave, you follow a routine? Come on, show of hands. You're like, I do, I tend to start <laughs> like here. Like for me, I tend to start right here. But when we shave, we follow a similar pattern. How many of you, by show of hands, when you put on your clothes, like the more you think of it, you go, I do. I follow a routine, even when I put my clothes on. We are hardwired for this. We, as human beings, we live rhythmically and we do it subconsciously. It's not something we think about. The good news is that God has provided the Sabbath as a weekly reprieve, a rhythm that can break the noisiness, the chaos and the busyness to, to help us restore both mind and and body, but here's the trick, friends. Unlike other things that we do, Sabbath rhythm is not subconscious. We have to consciously choose it. Now listen, look up here, here. You have a spiritual enemy. He goes by many names, but he has one goal. That one goal is to keep you from seeking and pursuing God first and to keep you from living God's way in your everyday life. And your spiritual enemy majors on noisiness. He majors on confusion. He majors on busyness. Your spiritual enemy rests satisfied when you cannot. Author and counselor John Eldridge wrote these words. I want you to see them. Eldridge wrote, caring for your heart 
is the first blow against the enemy's schemes. Where do I begin to care for my heart, for my body, for my soul? Well, that's what the good gift of Sabbath is all about. We're gonna learn this beginning in Genesis 2. Before we jump in, let's get a little background what's going on here. In Genesis chapter one, Genesis one depicts the seven days of creation. So for the first three days of creation, God forms creation. The next three days of creation, God fills creation. And on the climax, the sixth day, at the end of the sixth day, God creates humanity in his image. And so God's summary at the end of that sixth day, over all of his good creation, it's good. Indeed, God says it is very good. But if you zoom into Genesis chapter two, where we're gonna be, we see the seventh day. That's the day that God rested from all of his creative work. And he established a rhythm known as the Sabbath for us to join. Now listen, here's what the Sabbath says. Here's the message of Sabbath from God to us, from creation. Here it is. There's more to life than productivity. There's more to life than achievements and accomplishments. There's more to life than busyness. And so in the Sabbath, we learn that there's a rhythm that God has provided, that if we were to enter and join that rhythm, it would renew us, body and soul. So as we move through our tour through the scriptures today, I wanna show you three statements, and here's the first one. Sabbath, write this down, Sabbath means resting in God's control. We're gonna see that in our Genesis passage in chapter two. Sabbath means resting in God's control. Now help me out, nice and loud, true or false? Some people have no sense of rhythm, true or false? Come on, it's true. You don't believe me? Look at any dance floor at any time. You'll find someone doing something, you're like, are they okay? Should we call emergency services? I mean. Now, God made our human bodies to require rhythm just to live. Your human body was designed for rhythm. For example, your human body breathes in, breathes out. In, out. What's that? That's a rhythm. Your human body has a heart that beats according to a pulse. What's the pulse that beats in your body? It's a rhythm. Your body was designed to sleep and then wake, and then sleep and then wake. What is that? That's a rhythm. No. Break any of those rhythms for too long. What would happen? Would you thrive, yes or no? No. You, not only would you not thrive, you would die. Now, in the same way, friends, God made us to thrive. That's his goal. He made us to thrive. But we can only thrive when we live according to a weekly rhythm that he built to restore us body and soul. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a little participation exercise. So I want everyone to follow my lead at all locations. We're gonna find out in just a moment who's got rhythm. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna clap. I'm gonna clap and you're gonna follow me. So you do exactly what I do when I do at all of our locations. So we're gonna clap together on the count of three. Everyone follow me, do exactly what I do. Here we go, one, two, three. Good job, you guys got good rhythm. So here's a question, what kind of rhythm is that? Answer, that's the rhythm of God. God designed our lives and our bodies to go six days of work, one day of where we don't do productive, livelihood kind of work for a whole day. We just shut that down. Now listen, God never intended our bodies to go like this. Truth be told, there are many of us, that's the rhythm that we move to. Now let me just say this. It is not on God 
to get in sync with your rhythm and your tempo. Some of you are very frustrated in life and it's just things just aren't working. It is not on God to get on your rhythm and tempo. It is on us to align ourselves and sync our lives with his rhythm and his tempo, his six-week rhythm. What does that look like? We're gonna see that in Genesis chapter two. Let's notice in verses two and three. Genesis chapter two, verses two and three. It says that on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed, blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Or draw attention, that word rested occurs there twice, once in verse two, once in verse three. In the original language of the Old Testament in Hebrew, this word rested is the word Shabbat. Transliterated over to English, it becomes the word Sabbath. What does that mean? Well, the word literally means to cease, to stop. What did God stop? Verse three tells us, God stopped his work of creation. He stopped, he rested on the seventh. So why did God rest on the seventh day? Here's the thing, God did not rest on the seventh day because he was exhausted. It wasn't due to exhaustion, like man, whoo, took a lot out of me. It's not, what he, it's not why, well, how do you know? Scripture, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, says that quote, God does not grow weary. It's not why he stopped. Psalm 121, verse four says, quote, God neither slumbers nor sleeps. So when the scripture says that God rested, it literally in Hebrew says, God Sabbath on the seventh day. He stopped. In other words, God knew when to quit. Do you? Do you know when? It's enough. It's enough. Shut it down for a day. Done enough. Because God set into motion a pattern Six days of productive work, one day, stop. What are you doing on that day? Just not that, for sure. Notice that word seventh day. Those two words occurs three different times in our text. Now, biblically, the number seven signifies completeness or wholeness. So in Genesis chapter one and two, we see a complete cycle. That number seven gives us a beautiful cycle of time. God created, God completed, God rested satisfied in what he had made. And so God set a rhythm for us to join. Now, if we're gonna join this rhythm, six days of productivity, one day to rest satisfied, if we're gonna join this, two issues we have to face. I didn't put these in your notes, but you can write them down. Here's the first issue we'll have to face, and that is my control. Control is the first issue. By show of hands, how many of you know someone who's a control freak? How many of you are sitting next to someone who's, a, no, I'm sorry, wait a minute. <laughs> A lot of us are weird. A lot of us are control. We feel like if I don't do it, it won't get done. If I'm not on it, it's going to fall apart. And so, as a result, we try to control every aspect of life. We can't shut it down. We won't let it go. We can't turn it off. And as a result, we can't Sabbath. Now, let me just say this. To be honest with you, those of us who are, have control tendencies, and I have some of that, let's call it what it is. It's an attempt to be our own God. You're not in control. God is in control. We recognize and honor God's control by shutting it down for a day. So our control, my control, that's gonna be the first thing. The second issue we're gonna have to face is the issue of God's control. And I find this utterly fascinating. Now, just follow along with me for just a moment. Humanity was created at the end of the sixth day which means Adam's first day on the planet, his first full day would be the seventh day, which is also called the Sabbath day. So think about this one. Imagine that Adam wakes up on a Sabbath day. First day, God's like, morning, sunshine. God slips his arm around him. He says, all right, look around. Before you ever were, I already was. And I made all of this goodness, I provided all of it without your help. So take a day, take a day, soak it all in, bask in my goodness today because starting tomorrow, I got some work for you to do. You're gonna join me. 
That's the intention of God for us. But our culture around us, our culture is a different reality. In our culture, we, to just be honest, we idolize human effort. The more people are putting it out there and going hardcore, the more we go, yeah. In fact, I just wanna show you a quick example. A couple of years ago, right after COVID got going, Elon Musk posted this tweet. Here's the tweet. And again, this is early COVID, but just check this out. He says, working 16 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks in a year, and people are still calling me lucky. Now we know what he's saying, right? It's like, I didn't just fall into a lucky spot here. I worked, and that's awesome. That's great, that's good. I got no issue with that. What I'm saying is, let's look at the numbers, friends. 16 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. Does that rhyme with God's rhythm? No, it doesn't, and he's free to do that. God bless you, Elon Musk, do that all you want. Here's where my beef comes in. 4.7 million people go, yeah, more of that, love it. And half a billion are like, I gotta share this. I've gotta spread the gospel of human accomplishment. Friends, listen, constant work does not consume or define God. Constant work ought not consume or define God's people either. And so Sabbath is a, is a, it's a practice, it's a rhythm each week. And it gives us one day where we stop six days of productivity, six days of our livelihood. We just take one day and go, nope, I'm stopping. I'm shutting it down. I'm gonna spend a whole day just, just doing whatever reminds me of how good God is. Sometimes when we head into the concept of a Sabbath, what would I do? I mean, we don't quite understand it. Years ago, there was a New Zealand prayer book that posted an evening prayer. I thought, what a great prayer, what a great mindset of how to go from ending your productivity and into like a Sabbath day, whichever day you would choose. Here's, a, here's that prayer, it goes like this. Phenomenal prayer. What has been done, has been done. What has not been done, has not been done. Let it be. What a great prayer. I can lay my head on that pillow. So here's a question. Am I in sync with the rhythm of God or am I frustrated because things just aren't working out? Because friends, first of all, Sabbath means resting in God's control, but secondly, Sabbath means resting in God's care. In God's care, we have another passage. We're gonna go one book over in just a moment. Resting in God's care. Now, years ago, I spent some time in Central Africa, and our Ugandan partners there kept referring to me and to my American teammates as Mzungu. Over and over, hey, Mzungu, come here, Mzungu. What do you think of this, Mzungu? Like constant Mzungu. And after a while, I was like, wow, he's going special, Mzungu. <laughs> Until I asked him, what does Mzungu mean? Here's the definition of Mzungu. Quote, one who spins around. At first, I mean, to be honest with you, it kind of hurt my heart. I'm like, one who spins around. And I thought about, I totally resemble that remark. Like our team, we're driving, we're pushing, we're like trying to make everything happen. And the, the Ugandans were like, no, that's not how you do things. So let me ask you, would that definition apply to you? Could someone look at you and go, one who spins around? Because the truth is, in our achievement-oriented culture, it is really, this culture is achievement, or it's spinning so many of us around that my concern is we're caught in a spin cycle. Our achievement-oriented culture, listen, is driving some of our kids to be caught in a spin cycle of achievement and workaholism and overly busyness. Friends, God never intended for us to be caught in a spin cycle. And so because God loves us, and he really does, he, listen, he loves you. Not the version of you that's yet to be right here, right now. God really loves you, and he loves you so much that he intervenes to break the spin cycle. What does that intervention look like? Well, that's where we find the Ten Commandments. By show of hands, how many of you ever heard of the Ten Commandments before? You heard of that? Isn't that the movie with Charlton Heston where he led the Israelites across the Red Sea? Well, what God had intended in creation, that is this rhythm, six days productivity, one day basking in his goodness, what God intended for creation, they just didn't do. 
And so later, God then commanded his people Israel to do it. And that shows up in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. In fact, if you think about the Ten Commandments, think about this for a moment. God uses in the Ten Commandments five words to ban adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Five words. God uses four words to ban stealing. Thou shalt not steal. God uses four words to ban murder. Thou shalt not steal. I wonder how many words God used to talk about keeping the Sabbath. 83, 83 words about Sabbath keeping. The fourth commandment of Sabbath keeping. It's not just the longest commandment. It's the only one that has the power to break the spin cycle. It's a weekly cycle that breaks all cycles. How does it work? Let's lean in to that fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20 and verses eight through 11. God speaking to his people. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall do your labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day, it is the Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter. Let's pause there for just a second. If you're a parent, listen, you are responsible for the Sabbath rhythm of your home. And so if you're driving your child Saturday early all day, just driving them like cattle out to a field because they got activities they gotta do, would that qualify as Sabbath keeping rhythm for your family? Because the reality is not just me keeping Sabbath and having a one out of six day, a seven day rhythm, but it's also me with my family, making sure we as a family have that as well. God says on that day, you should do no work. You, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, the sojourner who's within your gates. You see how God wants everyone to get in on the good gift? You see it? Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in it. I told you it was rooted in creation. I told you. And God rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed. The Lord blessed. Do you want a blessing on your life? You want to enter into the blessing, the blessed life right here. He blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I draw attention to that word remember. Remember the Sabbath day. One scholar defines this term this way. It's, quote, the intentional act of calling something to mind in order to celebrate it. The question is, remember what? Like, celebrate what? And that's to remember the Sabbath, which says to us that all is provided by God, not the job. Praise God for the job, but the, God, the job does not provide. God provides. Who provided the job? God. Who provides the ability to do the job? God. So Sabbath is a reminder that all is provided by God, and it's also a reminder that God is in control. Not the forces of market, forces and productivity and you know supply chains, but God is the one who is in control. Listen, friends. The starting point of all human thriving is to rest body and soul in God's care and control. To rest body and control. So the point of now taking what was intended in creation of the Sabbath and making it a law, the point of the law is God's like saying, when it comes to this Sabbath, this is not a suggestion. This is an intervention. And some of us, we desperately need that intervention today. In fact, here's a picture of what I think God is doing by commanding the Sabbath. Here's what he's doing. God's like, man, you've been burning it. You've been grinding. You've been getting it done. Awesome. You should. Work hard, super hard. But if you don't take one day, what's going to happen? The cycle continues. And sooner or later, there'll be nothing left. And God in his love and mercy says, just take one day out of seven. One day where whatever your work, productivity, and livelihood is, you shut that down and pick one day where you just step away and stop. Everybody answer aloud. The opposite of to remember is to forget. So often we forget the Sabbath, which means we forget who God really is. 
He's the provider. He's in control. We forget who we are. We are dependent upon God. We are to move our lives according to God's rhythm and tempo. And we forget where life really flows from. We start thinking after a while, it flows from us. Now, Jews have a great way to both remember and celebrate the Sabbath. In fact, I want to share this with you. On Friday, uh, for, sa- for Jews, the Sabbath ceremony in the home is Friday sundown, and the Sabbath day runs to Saturday at sundown. Jews celebrate the Sabbath, and they remind themselves and celebrate the goodness of the Sabbath through what is called the Kiddush cup. I have a Kiddush cup right here. My wife, Rose, is Jewish. She grew up in a Jewish home, and this is a Kiddush cup. Now, on sundown, on Friday, the family will gather together, and they will read and recite a blessing, a prayer together called the Kiddush which means holy. It's a holy prayer and a blessing. And the Kiddush cup is comprised of a cup, a goblet, and a saucer. The goblet goes on the saucer. As the family recites the Kiddush prayer aloud, the father pours wine into the goblet. And the wine fills the goblet, then overflows down the side of the goblet, then fills the saucer. This is a beautiful picture of God's intention for the Sabbath. The goblet is the soul. The saucer is the life. It's to take a day to allow God to pour in reminders of his goodness, to celebrate his goodness so that it fills the soul and overflows to blessing the rest of the life. Now listen, friends. This is God's desire and God's design for Sabbath. But choosing to not keep Sabbath, choosing to not find a way to honor Sabbath in your own way, you're choosing to live like this. And you can have a full life and still have an empty soul. And empty people do not thrive. And we'll start going around looking for other people in other places to fill our cup. We're looking to a job or a promotion or a career or a relationship, significant other, something to fill a cup that only God intended to fill. And he can't fill it when we choose to operate against his own design. So friends, Sabbath keeping, I just want to say this to you. Don't hear Sabbath is a rule. Here's, I want to show, here's how I do Sabbath. Um, there's just simply put, here's the nutshell. Sabbath is the six days of productivity connected to your livelihood. That's what you do for six. Shut that down and have one whole day. You don't do that. That doesn't mean you're not active. For example, on my Sabbath, my Sabbath typically is actually Friday afternoon to Saturday afternoon. It's the only 24-hour period where I can literally be free from having nothing to do with anything productively related to my livelihood. So I do. It doesn't mean I don't do things. It doesn't mean I do disc golf. I'll hang out with people. I do all kinds. I'll help somebody go build something. I don't care. It doesn't mean don't be active. It means six days of productivity and labor for your livelihood. Shut that down. And on that seventh day, do whatever that reminds you of God's goodness. I'm walking a trail. I'm reminded by God's goodness. I'm throwing a disc and missing a goal wildly, I'm reminded of God's goodness. When I hang out with people, I'm, I, I just remind you, so you do it your way. Pick your own day. Pick some way of doing it, but just one day where you shut it all down and you just remind yourself, do whatever reminds you, God is so good to me. Eugene Peterson summarized all this perfectly. He said, nothing less than a command has the power to intervene in the vicious, accelerating, self-perpetuating cycle of faithless and graceless busyness. Friends, if you would keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath would keep you. Sabbath means resting in God's control. It means resting in God's care. And then thirdly, we're gonna see that Sabbath means resting in Jesus Christ. In the Gospels, Mark chapter two, we'll turn there in just a moment. 
Uh, I believe there are two kinds of people in this world. There are those who are rule keepers, and then there are those who are not rule keepers. By show of hands, raise your hand if you consider yourself to be not a rule keeper. Go ahead, be proud, raise your hand. These are my people right here. These are like my people, the rebels among us. How many of you, by show of hands, you go, no, I'm actually a rule keeper. Go ahead, raise your hands, raise your hands, keep them up, all the way up, keep them up. Now let's look around the room. This is why we don't like you. Because <laughs> we're rebels. Our only rule is there are no rules. I'm just playing, I'm messing with you. By the time of Jesus, the religious leaders turned the Sabbath into a rule that you keep instead of a rhythm that keeps you. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were driven by the rabbinic Talmud. And in there, there's a document called the Halakha that has 39 rules, 39 things you can't do on the Sabbath day. So the religious leaders in Jesus' day policed everybody else to make sure they didn't do those 39 things. And so often in the gospels, in fact, six different times, Jesus clashes with the religious leaders over how he practiced the Sabbath. Why? Well, they clashed because Jesus was fulfilling God's original intention for Sabbath. He was restoring people, body and soul. In fact, seven different times in the gospels, Jesus healed people on a Sabbath. And so one of these particular clashes, I just wanna show you right here in Mark chapter two. This is one of the clashes Jesus had. And he, Jesus said to the religious leaders, he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Notice those two words, for man. Turns out, friends, God gave us this blessing of Sabbath. It is something that is for you. It's a blessing for you, not a burden upon you. It's a blessing. Here's a little newsflash. Of the 10 commandments in Exodus 20, all of them are repeated in the New Testament as commandments to continue to do, except for the Sabbath, the fourth one. Why is that? Well, I think the answer is right here in verse 28. Jesus calls himself Lord of the Sabbath. Though the Sabbath is repeated in Hebrews 4, great Bible study, wink, wink, Hebrews 4, 1 to 11 this week, do that. What Jesus is saying is he, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the center of all spiritual life. Think of it this way. In the Old Testament, every major festival or ceremony tied to the religious practices of God's people Israel. In fact, I counted 10, 10 ceremonies, 10 major ones. Every one of them is launched from the Sabbath. Every one. So by Jesus saying, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, he's saying, I'm the ground. I'm the spiritual, I'm the center of all spiritual life. In other words, Jesus rules over the rules. God doesn't want our lives to be kept by rules. He wants our lives to be kept by Jesus. And there's a world of difference. Religious rule keeping says, I obey the rules. Therefore, God must accept me. But the gospel of Jesus is the exact opposite. The gospel of Jesus says, I'm accepted by faith in Christ and what he's done for me. Therefore, I joyfully obey. And friends, last week we were in Romans chapter 12 and we looked at the worshiping body and we learned in Romans 12 that when we offer our bodies to God, then we discover that God's will is good, it's perfect, it's acceptable. Only when we say yes to the ways of God and body and soul and enter into those things will we taste and see and know how good God's will really is. So the point of a Sabbath is not just take a day off, one out of seven. It's about joining the rhythm. Work for six, bask in God's goodness for that seventh. And friends, ultimately the Sabbath points us to Jesus Christ. Sabbath reminds us that God is the point of life, not productivity. We were not created for a job. We're not created for achievements. We were not created to be successful. We were created for God. So Sabbath is a reminder to us that God is the point of life. God is the provider of life. And God sent his son, Jesus, to achieve a salvation for us that we could never achieve for ourselves. And so entrusting ourselves to Jesus, we then can enter in to the rest, to rest in the completed work of what Christ has done for us. So when God finished his work of creation, he said it is very good. And he gave us a gift, the rhythm of Sabbath. When Jesus finished the work of our redemption on the cross, he said, 
It is finished. Nothing more to do. You don't need to strive, struggle, or prove yourself to God at all. Jesus said, it is finished. Come and rest in what I have done for you. Jesus is the one who invites us to come to him, to rest in him, to let him be our Sabbath, to let him fill our cup. Jesus is the ultimate Sabbath. In 1981, there was a movie called Chariots of Fire. Maybe you've seen it. It had seven uh, Academy Award nominations, and it won four of them, including Best Picture of the Year, 1981, Chariots of Fire. Maybe you remember it. It tells the true story of two sprinters in the 1924 Paris Olympics. One sprinter was Eric Liddell, a Scottish missionary, who, according to his own faith tradition, they viewed the Sabbath as Sunday. And so the gold medal race was to be run on Sunday. Eric Liddell, according to his own personal conviction, said, can't run on a Sunday. And so he, he opted out. No one had beaten Liddell. No one could beat Liddell. And so he opted out, and he lost out on the gold medal. The other runner, the other sprinter, is Harold Abrahams. Harold Abrahams is a Jewish man who won the gold medal that day in Liddell's absence. Both of these men had very different approaches to the Sabbath. Both of these men had very different approaches to life. Hear the difference. Eric Liddell wrote these words. He said, quote, God made me fast. When I run, I feel his pleasure. Harold Abrams said these words, quote, when the gun goes off, I get 10 seconds to justify my existence. Friends, the Sabbath opens before us two ways to live. One, work to justify your existence. Or two, to rest in God's pleasure. So let me ask you, which one are you? Which one do you want to be? Because I know which one I want to be. In the fourth century, the theologian Augustine wrote these words in his confessions. A little prayer to God. He says, because you have made us for yourself, our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Friends, if all we needed was just some physical rest, take a day. If all we needed was an emotional break, take a vacation. But let me ask you, where can you find spiritual rest for a weary soul, for the deepest issues that reside in the depths of your being? Friends, Jesus is the true Sabbath. And the strength of life comes not in how hard we work or strive or what we can accomplish. The strength in life comes from resting in Jesus, the one who says to us, come, come, let me fill your cup. I am your Sabbath. Come rest in me. Let's pray together. Father, we recognize from your word today that you made us to thrive. That's the goal. That's the motivation. And we can only thrive under your care and your control. We confess today, God, so often we forget. We get caught up in a spin cycle. We just chase after striving and achievement and busyness. And we just admit, God, that when it comes to Sabbath, it's just not something that we've entered into. And we also confess, God, truth be told in your presence, our cup is covered. And we recognize today that's, that's not your plan. So today, right here, right now, God, I choose to take the saucer and put it back under the cup. Thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, that on that cross, he took all our sins away so that in him there's no more striving, no more struggling, but freedom and life and rest and thriving. Holy Spirit, our prayer today, will you empower us to live according to this rhythm, to, to find our own way as a couple, as a family, to work hard for six, but for one day every week to bask in the goodness 
and what Jesus has done for us. It's in his name we pray and everybody said, amen. So if you're like me, you're thinking about all the things that are keeping you from that presence of God, all the things that are keeping you from being present in that Sabbath. Um, there, my favorite verse, I think, in the Bible is James 4 or 5 where he says he yearns desperately for the spirit he made to dwell within you. And God is yearning desperately for that time with you. And to think about that as we go through our week. And then for James 4, 6, even if you don't give it to him, he says, but he gives more grace. He gives more grace and you have that opportunity still passing you by every week, every day that we have. So think about that as, as we dismiss. Before we go, though, I want to remind everybody, we do have the potluck that we're having, so you're welcome to be a part of that. We want you to be, be here with us, even if you're a member, a non-member, a visitor, whatever you want to. You're going to find a little bit about the church after we eat, but even if you didn't bring anything, come and eat with us, all right? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone here and gathered here today, Lord, and thank you for your presence being in this room. Lord, would you guide us and direct us and help us to serve and help us to glorify you, Lord, with all that we do and all that we say, but most of all, help us to rest in your presence, Lord, and just take this message with us, Lord, and to spread the gospel, Lord, on those other six days. In Jesus' name, amen.